Hi, this is Bill Olson, and I'm pissed. Now, there's going to be talk on this show that you may not appreciate. There's going to be video on this show that you may not appreciate. There's going to be scenes of war and death and mayhem on this show that you may not appreciate. But the whole point is, what makes you think war is a valid recourse at all? At all, ever. What makes you think that you can turn to war? What you don't understand is that war is a con job deliberately put forward to enrich a small group of people. And we call them, without naming them, the military-industrial complex. And they run our country. And the product that, they, that their corporation puts out is war. And they, they sell it to us as if we're helping somebody, or as if we're saving somebody, or as if we're doing something good. And it has never, ever been the case when we send our war, our war machine after somebody. It's never been the case that we're doing something for somebody else. We're always stealing or robbing or killing somebody politically, whatever it is. And... The bottom line is don't let them get away with it. Don't ever accept the argument that that's a, a rational thing to do. Don't ever accept that argument. War, when war happens, you know that a con job has been successfully pulled off and you are the fool that accepted it. Okay, so now just to drive the point home, I'm going to play a video that you won't see on YouTube on my show because I'll get a what they call a trademark violation. I'll cut it out of this show before I upload it to YouTube. But it's a video from, oh, 2003 or 2004, I think, something like that. Shock and awe set to the uh, music, War Pigs. So this is a good one. And Okay, now remember, all those scenes you just saw were caused by governments, primarily ours. But people don't do that. You don't wake up in the morning and, and say, I, I, I want to completely burn my neighbor's children to death. You don't do that. Only our governments do that. <laughs> and if you have a, a really sick president... They'll joke about it, too. Well, it just makes me sick. I, I, I guess it's the naive, naive, naivety, and I don't know, it's kind of Pollyannish, expecting things to instantly get better just because you've discovered the evil out there and exposed it, and now it's gone, everything's okay, right? No, it doesn't look that way. All my life, I've felt like an outsider. I felt like nothing I ever voted for was happened, you know, and, and, and nothing that actually got passed was good. Everything that looked good on the surface turned out to be bad underneath. The Patriot Act, if it's the better the name, the worse it turned out to be. And I'm not a genius, but how about back in 2007, just before the Obama election, when everybody was running around and talking about hope and change and everything will be okay, the first black president, et cetera, et cetera. Well, you know, I've heard a lot of people getting real negative about it now and pretending, oh, I've always been against it. Oh, I've always thought, you know, right. Well, here's, here's a clip from my... 2007 show uh it's about no just about exactly november 1st uh, just about exactly the same time as as right now and we're going to jump in right about the seven minute mark or whatever it is and and play a section where i start talking about the upcoming election that's just three or four days away from what i'm saying so go ahead and play this and we'll be right back what i wanted to remind people of was that you know they're talking about 
Obama bringing change. He's going to be the next president of the United States. I think that's pretty clear now, without having the Republicans go full bore cheat on the elections like the last few. If you don't realize that, read or check with Greg Palast on the elections, and you'll find out how they've been cheated. But what change is Obama talking about, and what change are you Obama supporters expecting? Because if you're expecting us to get out of Iraq, you're out of luck. Obama's an imperialist, and his, his uh, advisors are neocons, Zbigniew Brzezinski. Uh, what it boils down to is, with Michelle Obama, an active participating member of the Council on Foreign Relations, you're not going to see a policy change. Remember, the Council on Foreign Relations are, is the group that sets policy for the United States. They're the part of the puppet master group, and with Obama's wife being a member of that group, there's a whole bunch of brain-dead meadow muffins out there yelling, we're going to have change, we're going to have change. Every time we have eight years of bullshit from one of these groups, they set up the other group to take over. I mean... It was obvious over a year ago when McCain was running, I said, are, the Republicans aren't stupid, so why are they deliberately running somebody that's going to lose? I mean, that couldn't have been obvious, more obvious. So it boils down to why on earth do you expect something to be different if we just re-elect the same people? The Democrats were instrumental in this economic collapse. The Democrats were instrumental in our invasion of two sovereign countries. The Democrats were instrumental in the stripping of, of our rights. And we all blame it on the Republicans. And we talk about, oh, everything's going to change now that we're going to get the Democrats in. Horseshit. That's just the other branch of the same party, the property party. And it's not your property. that they're Well, they want your property, but the only property they care about is theirs. Okay, so, you see, it, it, it was pretty obvious back then that there would be no change in policy. Uh, it's, it's absolutely astounding that people right now are lining up and arguing over Hillary versus Jeb versus Trump, and they're, they're taking these arguments seriously. They're, they're, as if it as if it matters, as if there's some choice to make, you know. Again, no matter who they elect, even if it's Bernie Sanders, you won't see any change in our foreign policy. Period. You won't. Nobody gets to run for the office unless the Council on Foreign Relations and and the Bilderbergers and, and the industrial, military industrial complex, unless they all agree that those people are, they, are their chosen. Anyone who gets elected from the entire group is going to carry on just exactly what we're doing now. Remember, their job is to sell the necessary wars to the population. They aren't creating the wars. Well, they, they are the instrument that causes the military to move and all that, but they didn't come up with the idea. They're being paid by these lobbyists. Remember, money is free speech. Well, they're being piled on with all this free speech. And in return, <laughs> the war of your choice. You know, and of course, we'll make sure that your corporation uh, gets to do all the no-bid contracts and we'll pay you like 15 or 20 times what it's worth, and then we'll let you double charge us and without penalty. You can charge for stuff that you didn't do without penalty, no problem. And that's the whole purpose, to generate profit for these elites that control everything. They don't give a damn about you or me, or the people that are out there. And every time you hear somebody say that we're there to save somebody, or we're there to help somebody, or we're there to install democracy, or we're there to train people to help themselves, we're lying when you hear us say that. We're just lying. You can figure it out easily. You see their mouths moving, they're lying. And why do they lie? Because your approval is important. Without your approval, it won't happen. 
and you sit back and you say, I'm just one person, what can I do? You can stand up and shout until you're hoarse. That's what you can do, and you better start doing it. Because if you don't, you will be sorry. Things are getting so bad now. Now I'm going to play another one of those music videos that I can't upload to YouTube. It's already on YouTube. You can go and find it yourself, and I recommend you do that if you want to see it again. And this is, you know, the artist is Jackson Brown. I used to listen to him way back in the 70s. But he did a song called Blood on the Wire. And this video that goes with it is so good. We'll be back in a minute. Doesn't matter anyway, does it? You have to get off your ass and actually stop the war yourself. Praying isn't going to do it. We see how much religion has helped out in this conflict. We get religion involved, and what you get is more war. So, anyway... The whole, this, this, my whole show, this, the origin of Free Speech Zone, that started out because of 9-11. I'm a member of Architects and Engineers for 9-11 Truth, and they've been doing a wonderful job of putting out videos, and putting out videos in all kinds of different languages. Um, they've just reissued one that I played maybe five years ago, and it's by Jonathan Cole, a, a one of the architects and engineers for 9-11 Truth, and he uh, created this wonderful video. It's called The Devil's in the Details, and basically it kind of puts into perspective the validity of the people who try to shut down the 9-11 truthers as some sort of kooks or conspiracy nuts or whatever, but the science stands on its own, and that's what uh, Jonathan Cole is actually defending in this video. And here's the latest release, and this one has subtitles in Italian. So call your Italian friends and let them know that they can get the information. So go ahead and play this. Each morning the sun rises in the east, and at the end of each day it sets in the west. This observation, as well as the motions of what the Greeks called wandering stars, or what we now call planets, was observed for thousands of years. It was assumed that the sun and the planets revolve in a perfect circle around the fixed earth. That notion, that the entire universe revolved around us, fit well with the concept of man's supremacy and of our feeling of being exceptional. Religious, as well as academic text, taught this geocentric universe and all the great thinkers, such as Aristotle, agree. Ptolemy described the planetary motions in a 13-volume treatise called the Almagest, which was used for over a thousand years. Sometimes the motions of those wandering stars or planets appear to go backward or retrograde from its normal path. In order to explain these motions without jeopardizing the geocentric concept, the original model was adjusted to show that some planets had small circles within their normal orbit, called epicycles. So using the geocentric model, the planetary motions would look like this. Very few asked any questions and most just believed what they were taught with the accepted model. Because everyone could see the obvious motion of the Sun, anyone who questioned the well-established geocentric theory was mocked or thought to be crazy. But some had questions, even if they didn't have all the answers. Those who questioned the fixed Earth got debunked by counter-arguments that they could not answer at the time. For example, if the Earth was spinning, why don't we get dizzy or just fly off? like water off a wet dog. Or, from a technical perspective, why didn't they see any stellar parallax or relative change in the positions of the stars as we orbit the Sun? Yet even though the motions of the planets is a scientific question and not a political or religious question, those who persisted were charged by the authorities as being a denier, or waterboarded, or indefinitely detained under house arrest, or burned at the stake. So, does the sun go around the earth, or the earth go around the sun? How do you know? How do we know? 
The reason we know is because careful measurements found small anomalies, and those little details did not fit using the established geocentric model. From the authorities' perspective, those details were the devil and had to be ignored or suppressed, because their dogma could not explain them. But most refused to look at any details or dare to think independently, or kept silent out of fear. In 1992, about 350 years after they threatened to torture him, the Vatican acknowledged that maybe he was right after all. And based on a recent science poll, about a quarter of all Americans still believe the sun revolves around the earth. But at least some headway has been made over the centuries. And for the most part, that dogma can be put to rest. Those who questioned the dogma in their day were called heretics. Those who question 9-11, or other events today, are now called conspiracy theorists. When careful observations were made of planetary motion, the geocentric theory no longer made any sense. When careful observation is made of the tower's fall, the official gravitational collapse theory no longer makes any sense. Observations through telescopes revealed round moons orbiting Jupiter, so the notion of everything revolving around the Earth no longer made sense. Observations through microscopes revealed round spheres of iron, so the theory that only an office fire was involved in the tower's demolition no longer made sense. When one observes retrograde motion of the planets, it's not because of any special epicycle, but because of the differences in orbital speeds of the planets going around the Sun. When one observes the smooth downward motion of the towers, or the freefall of Building 7, it's not because of a natural collapse, but rather some type of intentional demolition. Although they may look similar, planets don't orbit in a perfect circle, but rather an ellipse. Although they may look similar, this is the result of a gravitational building collapse, this is the result of a skyscraper fire, and this is all that's left of skyscrapers that were blown up. When one carefully tests the red-gray chips found in the dust, one realizes that it's not primer paint, but rather a military incendiary known as nanothermite. Galileo's telescope didn't stop working when pointed from the Earth to the sky, just because what he saw was contrary to religious doctrine. College physics doesn't become conspiracy physics just because we are studying how the buildings fell on 9-11. Carl Sagan understood the need to question authority so that we don't get bamboozled and abused like we have so many times in the past. If, if we are not able to ask skeptical questions, to interrogate those who tell us that something is true, to be skeptical of those in authority, then we're up for grabs for the next charlatan, political or religious who comes ambling along. Yet when questioned, the authorities involved claim total ignorance, even with the most obvious of details. Building 7 I often hear about. No plane hit Building 7. Why did Building 7 come down? What do you tell people? What is Building 7? Or what it was in Building 5 or the building that wasn't hit by the plane. Building 7. I have no idea. I've never heard that. <laughs> Sagan also understood how scientifically ignorant our leaders can be. Right. That's right. And if we don't understand it, and by we I mean the general public, if it's something that, oh, I'm not good at that, I don't know anything about it, then who is making all the decisions about science and technology that uh, are going to determine what kind of future our children live in? Just uh, some members of Congress? But there's no more than a handful of members of Congress with any background in science at all. And even our leaders are easily fooled, believing the most nonsensical dogma as long as it fits with their personal belief system. Uh, Congressman, uh, the evidence that the World Trade Center Building 7 was brought down with explosives on 9-11 is real and proven. And more and more people are waking up to it every day. How much more trust to the American public does Congress have to lose before it faces reality and acknowledges the need for a new investigation into Building 7's destruction? Um, I don't think it needs any more investigation. I, I, don't, I don't think that, uh, I think the way that those towers were brought down were by radical Islamic terrorists, and uh, that's the way it is, and I think every investigation has shown that so far. Did you read the 9-11 investigation no, by the committees? No, I did not. But you think it was adequate enough? Yeah, yeah I think so. 
While 19 radical Islamist terrorists might have been in the planes, they could not have blown up the towers, no matter how much it agrees with his beliefs. But another 19 had the means and motives to take those towers down. In the investigations he didn't read, never explained the devilish details, including the downward motion of the towers. The source of the sulfur considered to be the deepest of mysteries. The fall of the spire. Those spheres of iron. The free fall of seven. The nanothermite. And so much more. The study of evidence and motion of the planets is not heresy, it's science. The study of evidence and motion of how buildings fall is not conspiracy theory, it's science. The rush to judgment is inherent in all of us, based on the limited information we receive. If you don't understand the details of an event, you will fall for the official story explained by the authorities and their media. From their perspective, it's critical to keep the people confused and the details hidden, because those details are the devil to their dogma. But the people are waking up, realizing that their own government is behind some of the largest of crimes. And once those details are exposed, we can see that the emperor is wearing no clothes. So why would a government attack their own citizens? Well, one reason might be to get public support to attack those who got blamed. But to hide the details, they must either control or outright ban the media. See, the banning of YouTube was actually prompted by a video posted on the site that was allegedly leaked from top Turkish officials. In the discussion, head of Turkish intelligence, Hakan Fidan, says, quote, I'll send four men from Syria if that's what it takes. I'll make up a cause of war by ordering a missile attack on Turkey. We can also prepare an attack on Suleiman Shah's tomb if necessary. So basically, Turkey's intelligence chief is saying that he's going to make up a false pretext to militarily intervene in Syria by hiring four men to attack his own country. As the undersecretary of the Minister of Foreign Affairs explains, we're going to portray this as al-Qaeda. Wow. See, this bombshell leak describes something known as a false flag operation. A false flag is a covert military operation designed to appear as if it were carried out by other parties and is usually used as a pretext for military intervention with the citizens of the country unaware of their government's premeditated actions. But amazingly, anyone who simply acknowledges proven false flags throughout history is labeled a conspiracy theorist. Like yesterday's heretics, maybe someday all those who are exposing today's devilish details will be exonerated. And perhaps it's appropriate that Galileo's middle finger remains on display. Because the sun doesn't revolve around us, we revolve around the sun. And those buildings didn't naturally fall down. Those buildings were intentionally blown up. How do we know the earth goes around the sun and those towers were intentionally blown up? The devils in the details. Okay, the devil is in the details, and I like that little point in there about, you know, they depend on your ignorance because they manipulate it to get your approval. And what did I say earlier about, you know, Congress and the president? What is their job? If you said anything besides salesmen, you're wrong. Their job is to sell the wars that the elite want to have to you and me and somehow justify it. So that's why they keep the 9-11 stuff, you know, hammered with charges of conspiracy theorists and things like that. Uh, they're desperately keeping you ignorant because as soon as you get wise, they don't have any more control over you. And yeah, you can do something as an individual by locking arms with the individual next to you until you're an impenetrable wall that lies won't affect. Okay, well, we're going to move on now. Uh, it's an interesting thing going on with the ISIS thing. Remember, we created Al-Qaeda, and then when everybody got hip to that, we changed their name to, uh, what, it was Is Islamic State, or I, I don't even know which order it was, but anyway, it morphed into ISIS. But 
it's still exactly the same thing. It's it's the teenage bullies in the neighborhood that the glass company owner hires to go around breaking windows at night to improve business. Well, Al Qaeda and ISIS, the same thing, are are bullies that we send out all over the the Middle East to uh, you know prove that there's terrorism. Why we have to continue the war against terrorism, and uh, so. But along comes Putin. And he was, he's a, a really smart guy, I'll tell you. I really admire it because here we put ourselves in a logical paradox, an impossible position of supporting the war on ISIS while at the same time protecting it because we don't want them to go away. It's necessary to have the bad guy. And as soon as we got rid of bin Laden, we had to have another bad guy. Um, because otherwise the... the corruption that is the war on terror which is a ridiculous thing in the first place but they've already sold that to us uh get it it, it gets to continue it gets to just keep going because you know they successfully sell the idea that there's some madman over there putting babies that were in incubators putting them on the floor and stomping on them oh we've got to send all our military might and kill every human being in the area and we say, okay, yeah, right, oh, yeah. And we get our stupid, asinine uh, politicians up there, you know, kissing each other's ass and talking about who can kill, each, who can kill Arabs better than anybody else. In the trick word of defending the United States, we've never needed a defense. We're the, we're the offense that the world needs protection from. And and we are the first line of that protection because our military is the biggest military that's ever existed in the history of the world. Our empire is the biggest empire that's ever existed in the history of the world. And the only way that's going to collapse is from inside. So it's our job to make sure that this empire that is so corrupt and so murderous and so disdainful of any human being that it should not be allowed to exist. And if you want to continue thinking American exceptionalism is true, that we really are the force for truth and justice, then maybe you ought to help make it that way for the first time in history. It just pisses me off that everything they told me when I was in grade school about how great our country was, was a damned lie. And now we have kids growing up that are being fed the same crap. And are they, if, if this self-censorship that we sometimes do on ourselves, or maybe more direct actual censorship is effective, the kids that are growing up today won't have a clue and will have to go through the learning curve all over again. We already know that the war is a con job. Any war is a con job just to make some unscrupulous sociopath rich beyond anybody's imagination. And they sell it to us and we go, meh, meh, we're saving lives. Meh, meh. You know, we ought to have machine guns that go, meh, when we're saving lives with our fully auto machine guns and saving lives with our remote controlled killing machines, saving lives by completely incinerating an entire wedding party that had nothing to do with the target. And we do that routinely. And it's not a mistake. It's not an unintended consequence. We didn't accidentally bomb the Afghan hospital. We did that to control them, to spread fear and to prevent them from uprising and kicking us out. If the world rose up and kicked us out of every place that we've brought our corruption, we could not stop it. In fact, right now, our military is so absolutely spread so thin, it cannot win. We have not won any military battles since before Vietnam. And, and they're pretending that we're the most powerful force. Well, we might have the most power, but we can't win a campaign it's, I mean, so it's, we're not 
trying to win. Don't you understand? It's not a win or lose situation. We are trying to continue the war. We are trying to have permanent war. We are trying to find more people to kill because they're beginning to get too scarce. We have to invent new enemies. Okay, well, I've talked over a good 10 minutes of the, of, of the video that I want to play. This is Chris Hedges, and he's going to be talking about how ISIS is the new Israel. And I urge you to go to YouTube and watch the rest of this video that you won't be able to see because we're going to end it, you know, right at the end of the show. And watch Chris Hedges', Chris Hedges uh, series on YouTube, and it's called uh, Days of Revolt. I think that's what it is. Anyway, you'll see it when it comes on. Here we go, and I'll see you next week. I've been terrorized all my day. I'm all my day. Hi, I'm Chris Edges. Welcome to Days of Revolt. We're filming this segment in Toronto with Professor Saba El Nasri, who edited Arab Revolutions and Beyond. He's a professor at York University teaching Middle East politics and is a native of Basra, Iraq. Uh, we're going to do this in two segments. Uh, the first one will be focused on the rise of uh, the Islamic State uh, known as ISIS, and the second will be on the Arab Spring and Arab Revolutions, putting them in a historical context uh, and trying to grasp what's going to be uh, uh, or what's going to come next within the Middle East. Thank you, Professor Al Nasri. Thanks, Chris, for having me. So let's begin with ISIS, which is historically yeah. uh, an extremely important movement within the Middle East. Uh, the 1916 Sykes-Picot Agreement, uh, which uh, is named for the French and British diplomats that carved up the Middle East right. among uh, the colonial, uh, you, you know, among the empire, turning, uh, uh, essentially turning uh, countries in the Middle East into protectorates has only been changed twice. Uh, for the first time was the uh, Israeli independence movement, uh, which rose up in Palestine, and now with ISIS, which controls an area roughly the size of Texas. Mm -hmm. The mechanisms that were used to redraw the map in the Middle East are the same. Uh, the use of foreign money, mm -hmm. the use of foreign fighters, uh, the tactics of ethnic cleansing and terrorism, and this mythical vision, uh, in the case of Israel, the, the recreation of Judea and Samaria from the Bible, the land of Israel, right. and in the case of ISIS, yeah. the recreation of the seventh century caliphate. And, and these tactics have proved quite effective. Right. In both cases, in the case of Israel and in the case of ISIS, you could argue, especially with ISIS, have roughly 20,000 foreign fighters, mm -hmm. that these are forces that are as dependent on the out areas outside the Middle East as within the Middle East. Right. And I wondered if you could kind of address that phenomena, this phenomena right. that we're watching. Right, right. I mean, you are right because ISIS has a kind of subtle colonialist form. Yes. The way they occupy space, clean this space, plunder the resources. Which is what is, as Israel does. Exactly. And, and, and curve out territory for itself. But to understand the, the phenomena of ISIS, we need to contextualize it within the setbacks and counter-revolution against the Arab revolutions. Right. The amount of violence, of intervention 
in Libya, for instance, the war in Libya, the uh, civil war in Syria, now the war also in, Li in, in, in Yemen. And, and we can't forget Egypt. Exactly, we don't forget Egypt. And the, the uh, f failure of these peaceful, non-violent revolutions, right. um, this amount of violence, of counter-revolutionary violence, created this Frankenstein, this phenomenon. So you can say uh, ISIS is, is a Hegelian fish synthesis of two forms of violence. Now, th what is so interesting about ISIS and why it is so attractive for many young, unemployed, um, mostly Arab fighters, most of the fighters, by the way, they come from Libya or Tunisia and so on, less from Europe, etc. It's mostly from the Middle East. What attracted them to ISIS is that when this peaceful revolution failed, revolutions turned into kind of jihadism. Yes. That ISIS is much more effective in its leadership, organization, logistical stru structure, and its ideologies than all the other peaceful, non-violent movements, well, mass movements. And we have to go back to Egypt, because yes. with the rise of Morsi and the Muslim Brotherhood, there right. was this debate between the Brotherhood, yes. which said, no, we can take power through elections, right. through nonviolent means, right. and the so-called Salafis right. in Egypt, right. who actually were uh, convinced yes. by the Brotherhood. Yes. I, I think there were roughly 60 Salafis, I can't remember the exact number, within the parliament. Right. And yes. then with the overthrow of Morsi, yes. and, and, and the thing about Morsi, uh, with all of the mistakes that Morsi yes. made in terms of turning on the secular opposition, is that he worked overtime to try and placate the military. Yes. Uh, and in, in, in countries like Iraq or Egypt, mm -hmm. the military is not just a military force, but an economic force. Right. They control whole segments of the economy, Correct. including military industries. Correct. Correct. And um, it failed. The yes. military, certainly with the support of probably Washington yeah. and Israel, right. certainly with the support of Israel, yeah. uh, and, and that sent a message not only to the Salafis or the jihadists right. in Egypt, right but throughout the Middle East. Right. But it's interesting to see that this message uh, can take two different forms. The first one, you can see a positive form. If you look at Al-Nahda in Tunisia, um, who actually won the election and the presidency and so on, until recently, until last year. But what happens in Egypt with the Muslim Brotherhood, the Al-Nahda took a different direction. They basically rolled back and opened up much more space to the Nida Tunis, which is much more left liberal, um, platform who won the election of the presidency because they realize if they pursue such a confrontational cause they might be you know oppressed and and, and inhalated so it, it took a positive form whereas in Iraq and Syria due to the context a different context we have ISIS right. so what I was saying is the first type of violence was the physical military intervention of violence the second one is the systemic corruption the, mm. the, the, the expropriation and, 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 and disposition of the majority of the people of their resources, public resources. And this is very clear in Iraq. The way the United States institutionalized the political system and all this formula of muhasasa, right. you know, sharing, power sharing formula, it actually um, debriefed all the Iraqi people from the, the access to the public resources they used to have. And I think we should just interject here <coughs> yeah. by saying that before the war, yeah. Iraq had a very vibrant middle class. Exactly. Uh, I remember uh, visiting Iraqi hospitals, which yes. I think were built by the Swedes. I mean, they were modern yes. hospitals. Yes. Uh, yes, Saddam Hussein ran an extremely repressive and Correct. horrific regime, Correct. but economically, Correct. Iraq yes. shared in the oil wealth of the country, Correct. the average Iraqi. Correct. Part of the legitimacy of the Ba'ath Party it was not only based on violence. But the Ba'ath Party was the ruling party, we exactly. should say, in It's Iraq. not only intelligence and violence. Uh, right. That's true, too, but I think the biggest chunk of the legitimacy of the Ba'ath Party was based on the redistribution of the oil income in, form, in forms of free public yeah, health care, right. education, very fine pension, educational so system. Yeah. So even the majority of the Shiites and the Kurds, right, who hated Saddam as in Ba'athists, right. benefited from this redistribution of the income. Now, with the privatization of Bremer, which who people, Iraqi people called the Caliph of Baghdad in 2000. Bremer was the American. Exactly. Right. In May 2003, right. the privatization and the institutionalization of of the U.S. strategy of shock and awe, which is state-sponsored terror on the one hand, and cash, corruption, using money to buy 
the uncoopt some forces in Iraq. It was institutionalized. Right. So the outcome of this, you have the, one of the most corrupt states in the, on the face of this earth. So the majority of the, of the people in the Middle East, the absolute majority, up to 65% are tw under 24 in Iraq. 45% of the young people are under 14, so it's the youngest population probably uh, on a worldwide scale. Now, what do they see? They see at the top of the state a systemic corruption, you know, the, the, pl systematic plundering and uh, of the resources of the country, and they transfer all these resources to outside the country. There's no health care, no education, right. no jobs, no pension, no nothing. On the other hand, they see ISIS. Okay, y they pay you $500 a month, and they share with you any resources they plunder, be it oil or gas right. or, or, or taxes, they dispute this among their followers. Now, if you are a young Iraqi, Syrian, Libyan, etc., you see peaceful revolution fail because right. there was an, an, an immense you know, external and internal intervention in a violent way. The state is corrupt, but then Prim there's primary, much effective... Right, it's not only corrupt, but it's yeah. also sectarian in sectarian, the sense that it, exactly. it feeds a Shiite elite exactly. at the expense of the Sunni majority. Exactly, and sectarian in the sense, not in a religious sense, but in a class sense. So you have the majority of the people, the young people in Iraq, have no jobs, no education, no health care, no perspective whatsoever. They are arrested, incarcerated for no reasons. There were so many protests the last few years for basic services, for electricity, water. And we should water. say non-violent mass protests. Non-violent. And yeah. they were faced by these militias of different parties in power. And a lot of people were massacred right. in Basra, in Baghdad, etc. Right. So and then on the other hand, they see an effective form of organization like ISIS. They can earn money. They can share the resources. And they can push back against this class-based sectarian politics within the country. So you have these young people looking at ISIS. Right. They earn $500 a month. These are the fighters. The fighters. And if they occupy a territory, if there's oil, gas, whatever resources they take, they redistribute the resources among their followers. Right. And they collect taxes. And they're very good against corruption. And they're good against corruption. And they bring services, basic services, to the people. Right. And Mosul now you have electricity, but not Baghdad and Basra. Right. Why is this the case? Because most of the, at least the leadership of ISIS, most of them used to be Iraqi bureaucrats and officers and generals. People have enormous institutional experience. They know how to run things compared to the current corrupt political class in Iraq. So they know how to deal with this everyday life. They know how to bring services to the people. So these are the options the young people have. One, a corrupt, pol a corrupt political system. On the other hand, an effective, violent, but much more socially and ideologically appealing organization and than the current And there's two system. important points about ISIS. Yes. Uh, the first is that much of the territory that ISIS controlled Control, yeah. was in chaos. Yeah. Um, and people forget that yeah. there were, you know, competing warlords and, uh, you know, people were being kidnapped for money. Right. And uh, so civil society completely broken right. down, yes. courtesy of the American yes. occupation. Yes. And, uh, and for whatever terror ISIS carries out, and it certainly yeah. does carry out horrific yeah. Yeah. terror, yeah. Uh, it has brought, as you point out, yeah. a semblance of if not normalcy, at least order. Right. That's the first right. attraction. Right. The second yes. is that, as you have also pointed out, um, the deep disappointment, especially among the young, mm -hmm. in the failure of the Arab Spring, Correct. the failure of these nonviolent movements, uh, has made them ask the question, which is a question that people in the Middle East have been asking since the end of World War I. Right. Yes. How are we going to build an authentic liberation movement. Right. This is what was the impetus of uh, Nasser in Egypt exactly. and, and of course the Ba'athists yes. who are really just what are a mirror in essence of yeah. the Nasserites. Yeah. Um, and these secular regimes soon became corrupted right. and, and not only became corrupted yeah. but eventually became tools Correct. of imperial power once again. Correct. Um, you know Hosni Mubarak being yeah. a kind of classic example yeah. of that. And so uh, the ability of ISIS to bring order and to actually function as a liberation movement. You see that when the 
when they uh, are tear down the border post between Syria and Iraq. Iraq, they will write, this is the end of Sykes-Picot, right. the 1916 right. agreement that, 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 that the imperial powers used to redraw the map right. of the Middle East, and, and that is true. Correct. And two things. The, the first one is, um, I don't think it, it's, I think it's very simplistic to demonize one force and forget about the others. So ISIS, yes, is a terrorist organization, but so too the Iraqi state is well, with its militia, so too the U.S. And let's not leave out, you know, let me, let me, uh, you know, that's a very important point because uh, remember when they captured the Jordanian pilot right. and they burned the Jordanian pilot in a cage, in a cage yes. which was barbaric and yes. horrible, but, but why? Because American planes.